Pathology, and then he moved over to Institute of Animal Genetics in Edinburgh, where he did his PhD with renowned geneticist, Herman Joseph Mutter. He did not get any salary, and he was he started his career like this, working on grasshoppers, because working on trisocular genetics was not easy. And then from becoming assistant lecturer to lecturer and reader, he was offered the position of professor and head of the department of zoology in Banas University. The intriguing part of it is that he was not very keen on coming. He was invited as a professor, he was offered the position, and he wasn't very keen on coming here. The reason being, he thought, that the kind of zoology that he envisages, the departments in India were not teaching the zoology of the level that he wanted to be taught. And so if he had to become an administrator too, along with the professor, then he had to have the freedom to make zoology as vibrant as he thought it to be, a science of, of animal science that's called other than a post-mortem subject. And this university gave him all the freedom and the support, not only the making of a new department, earlier zoology was a wing of department of physics, a new building, extremely eminent new faculty, refurbishing the whole course of zoology in a very modern sense. What should be appreciated in this case was that he was not interested only in doing it in zoology and BHU, but he was a very seriously work for having zoology catapulted into a vibrant subject all over the country. And therefore, wherever he could go and do and work, he did try to see the new subjects, cell biology, which was earlier called the cytology, uh, biochemistry, environmental biology, developmental biology, all that became part of the curriculum. And that made him different from many of the teachers. I am just reminded of a, of, a, of a quote which he talked about when he was the president of the Cell Biology Society of India, the first Cell Biology Society meetings presidential address. I just quote a sentence from him. He said, we should realize that cell biology cannot remain at the periphery of biology course as an esoteric subject, but must come at the center and around it the whole course should be built up. That was the kind of concept he carried with him and he wanted zoology to become, which to a very large extent he succeeded and those who followed him in this department and elsewhere tried to keep up with that. But what makes Professor Raichaudhri slightly different from all others is that he realized that communication of science as a teacher is important. But as a teacher, what is even more important is creation of new knowledge. And that creation of new knowledge means that research should be at the front and center of our activity. And that made a very big difference. And now we know that the Department of Zoology of BHU, and actually speaking, animal science all over the country is one of the most growing and science of the common technology and whatever else has made it a wonderful area to be working on. He passed away on 15th of February 1994 and it was a witness of things that his students, colleagues, friends, family members, we all thought that his vision should be conveyed further and further by having a small foundation and to see how we can spread science in general public to develop what we call as scientific temple. And it was with this intention that a foundation was created. And one of the activities of foundation is to have this lecture. But obviously, this lecture, one lecture in a year, does not really serve the purpose. And the challenge is that how we go into the public and do that. Shortage of funds and other things do make it a difficulty for us to do that. But we have revived it. And we are beginning to do some more of these activities now. So very recently, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Akhtar Lee, he volunteered to help us organize such an uh, outreach kind of a program. And when we are now begun to go to schools at different places where we can do uh, what you call as extension work. So we went to a school recently. Uh, I think it will be one minute. Yeah. We have to restart. Okay. So. Uh, the idea is that we want that the science to be not only in the science departments, but in life as a whole. People and public of this country should realize that science is the only way to analyze, understand, and go forward. 
we have to think in terms of rational thinking and that's how we do and a series of lectures we we do is also planned the same way that we have simplified version of intricate science presented to us all students of science and even those who are not students of science so this is just a 1 minute or less than a minute uh, video which shows why 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 Does it work? Wait, come from there. I'm very sorry. I, I've taken more than the time that was allotted to me, but I thought yes. So uh, this is what uh, I I wish. If Dr. Akhtar Ali is around, if he can just stand up, I want. So it is thanks to Akhtar that it was possible to do this extension work. We went to the school, which is at Lala Lakpat Rai School of the University itself, where we did. So we went go there, speak to teachers and the students about what the science is all about. Why did you move? So we could go show to the students in the microscope how cells look like, how diseases occur, what inheritance is, and so on. And then, so you can see there are the microscope children are coming and they are seeing under the microscope how chromosomes look like, how cells look like, and they were very excited. And not only that, if the teachers had not seen the the microscopes and the chromosomes in the manner that they did then, and then we took their blood samples of the teachers particularly for testing for certain of the things like blood profile, vitamin B, vitamin D and so on. So that's the kind of activity that we will proceed further with and try to do. And as I said, our foundation runs short in money. If any of you is willing to help us, we are very happy with it. So with these few words, welcome very much. Welcome you all and thanks for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And I think uh, learning about Professor Spirai Chaudhary was indeed great. Now we know more why we are celebrating this, uh, you know, him every year. And I think these kind of activities, as sir has shown, uh, they are very important for the society as well as as outreach for for us. So definitely, your support will be, you know, more than welcome. Uh, with that, I would request Professor uh, Madhuji Tapadia. The convener of today's event, please uh, introduce our speaker. Thank you, Richard. And uh, respected Professor Chandrima Shah, speaker for today's evening. Professor A.K. Tripathi, Director, Institute of Science. distinguished professor at Indian Institute of Chemical Biology in Kolkata and she just completed her term as president for Indian, Indian National uh, INSA, Indian National Science Academy and earlier she was vice president of the same academy. She is elected fellow of uh, Academy of World Academy of Sciences, INSA, INA, NASI and council member for many national and international academic bodies. She completed her uh, graduation and post-graduation from uh, University of Calcutta, West Bengal. And then later she joined PhD at ISCB with Professor Bakrashi. After completing her PhD, she moved for postdoctoral uh, fellowship at uh, Kansas Medical Center and Population Center at New York. And later she came back to India join as 
staff scientist at the National Institute of Criminology at, uh, in 1994. And there she initiated a work on uh, cellular defense mechanisms and uh, the ways uh, how uh, and what is the involvement in the role of apoptosis. And she and she uh, she has majorly contributed to how Leishmanesis, uh, uh, how they you know they cause uh, Kalazar disease, which is which becomes fatal if not corrected early on. And she has major contributions into that. And uh, she is recipient of many, many national and international awards. And we are really proud to have her here amongst us to deliver this uh, Professor SPRC Memorial Lecture. And uh, uh, having said that, I would also like to add that I have been associated, I have known her, not associated exactly, I've known her though very indirectly at National Institute of Mineralogy and what strikes to an onlooker at the first instance is her very quiet demeanor. She, though she, uh, she's a person of few words and however, she's very approachable and she very readily discusses any, if you have any, anyone has any uh, questions, you know, in the mind related to science, or some kind of, that time we were doing some new experiments were being done and a uh, lot of troubleshooting for uh, you know, certain experiments, especially sequencing, we used to go to her and she was always ready to help her. So with these few words, point. Maybe <laughs> 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 Visible, automatic visible. Of course, color. Yeah. 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 Tribute to him, 
But before that, I would like to acknowledge that I have received a very warm welcome from the Department of Zoology. I uh, visited the department today and I am amazed to see the commitment, the collaboration, the camaraderie that's there. And it gave me a very nice feeling. And it seems that uh, I'm back uh, to my family. Of course, we are all part of an extended uh, scientific family, but I'm very happy to be here. This is my first visit to the zoology department, although I have known many people over the years. So I um, actually wanted to uh, say a few words about Professor uh, Rajudri, but Professor Raman has already said. But uh, I wanted to say that he became the chair of Department of Zoology um, uh, at Calcutta. He didn't. He was a professor at the Department of Zoology at Calcutta, and he went to JVS Alden. I don't know if you, all of you are familiar with his name. He's a very famous uh, British scientist. He established the first Drosophila laboratory at the University of Calcutta. And we, um, as I said, we were, uh, we always looked up to him. And he made, as Dr. Professor Raman uh, alluded to that, uh, many fundamental contributions. And he successfully propagated the idea of commitment to science and the spirit of service through science. So for a, for a scientist, I think that's what one aims for and not everybody achieved it, achieves it, but he did. So today, what I thought I would discuss a part of our work, but uh, as I understand that there are students here, I have made the things uh, a little easy to understand. So I uh, request the indulgence of the experts here, and I will uh, discuss uh, uh, some something about host pathogen interactions in the backdrop of the challenge of the emerging and re-emerging diseases. So um, first, if we want to know what are emerging and re-emerging diseases for those who are not very familiar with it, that there are previously unknown infectious agents or pathogens that evolved over time. I'm, I'm using a, uh, I'm using a pointer, which is within, within the computer, so I hope you can see it. And then known pathogens whose role in specific diseases have previously gone unnoticed. So there are some pathogens like that. Then also infectious agents that have spread to new geographic locations or new uh, populations, which you all know how COVID-19 spread and the SARS-CoV-2 spread from China to all over the world very quickly. So uh, there are infectious agents that in the previous time of pandemics that I will allude to in tomorrow's lecture, they have also spread all over the world in very fast speed, even if the world was not, but did not have travel as much as today. And so a uh, new reemergence of pathogens whose incidence has significantly reduced. For example, you may not be familiar with smallpox, but when we were young, we used to take the smallpox vaccination. So if smallpox is totally eradicated from Earth, but if smallpox were to come back today in some way, we have only two vials of smallpox left in the world, one in America and one in Russia. So if it were to come back, that would be a re-emergence of pathogen whose incidence has significantly reduced. Um, then no agents that have mutated to new forms. You have seen with SARS-CoV-2 that it has um, mutated several times and we have gone through several variants, the last one being the Omicron. And then agents transmitted by the uh, zoonotic transmission. And that is a very important uh, uh, issue because we uh, about 80% of the diseases are uh, transmitted from the animals. And we live in close contact with the animals and the more and more we are uh, disturbing the forest, there is deforestation, there is encroachment in the forest area. We are coming in close contact with the different vectors that transmit the diseases from the animals or the animals themselves. And that is how the incidence of zoonotic diseases are increasing. And if you notice the literature, there is an incredible increase in papers on zoonotic diseases over the last 10 years. So that is one thing to consider that how we do we avoid zoonotic transfer. 
So if you look at this uh, particular uh, map, you see the new, new, the red dots are newly emerging diseases, the blue dots are re-emerging diseases, and uh, the black is the deliberately emerging diseases. And you can ponder over this, uh, which, which is published in, in uh, Cell, and you see that some of them have uh, relocated geographically from one place to another, and the map looks so formidable that we have a great challenge in front of us. So the research in infectious diseases is very important because what is important is our health and how, how fit we stay. For that, we have to fight diseases. And that is why I think uh, this, this map is a lot to ponder about like, what we are up against. So, uh, you know, when humans evolved, when a group of apes actually evolved into the genus Homo, there were about eight or nine subspecies of which the only one remains, which is the Homo sapiens, which are migrated out of uh, Af sub-Saharan Africa and distributed all over the world. And since microbes evolved about uh, three, uh, 4.5 billion years ago, and uh, humans came about 6 million years ago, they have co-evolved. The humans have co-evolved with the microbes, the bacteria, the viruses, the fungi, and the parasite. And what has happened that there has been a race with these pathogenic microbes. Uh, so the, the host always tries to uh, get rid of the pathogen. By pathogen, I mean what I said, viruses, bacteria, etc. So the selective forces of nature, which we call uh, forces of natural selection, acts on the host to... Uh, oh, it's okay, I'll use this one because it's pretty obvious. Uh, so uh, the selective forces actually act on the host so that it can own its uh, pathways to get rid of the pathogen, which becomes better and better. And the selective forces also act on the pathogen for them to create a um, uh, infection in the host, for them to succeed in creating an infection in the host. And this all happens during evolution. And what has happened is that this constant uh, interaction between the host and the pathogen and a plethora of pathogens. If you look at there are so many pathogens there. We have good bacteria, we have bad bacteria. So the bad bacteria are bacteria, viruses, bad parasites. They are actually forcing us, our immune system to evolve. And so what happens is what we see today, our immune system is actually the product of this constant tussle. So in the immune system, we have uh, you know, the first line of defense are three types of cells, like the dendritic cell, the macrophage, and the neutrophils, which are actually the phagocytic cells. They can eat up pathogens, destroy them. In connection, we need really connection. Yeah. Sorry about this. Sorry, no, not me. I think the internet was a big So every time it goes, it just goes away.
bombarding this pathogen with reactive oxygen species. And lysosome is another bag of enzymes which actually can uh, digest macromolecules of the cell. And that phagosome and lysosome fuses and produces a phagolysosome. And this phagolysosome then digests the pathogen which is either discarded off or antigen presentation is there where other cells will recognize that oh, this pathogen is there, so we need to mount an immune response. So the phagosome is a very important organ in the body. It's a, it's a, in, the, in the cell, because the phagosome contains in its membrane an enzyme called the NADPH oxidase. NADPH oxidase actually donates an electron to the molecular, to the molecular oxygen in the cell through this, um, through this multi-subunit enzyme. And this electron actually converts the molecular oxygen to superoxide. And superoxide is very harmful. I'll just show you how superoxide can act. And the, the NADPH is the source of that electron. And what is important to realize that this is a very, very important enzyme in NADPH oxidase. And people who do not express uh, NADPH oxidase have a disease called chronic granulomatous disease in which they cannot uh, kill the pathogen, so constantly they're having various kinds of infections. So that's the CGD uh, disease. And if you look at what the molecular oxygen, uh, after being converted to superoxide does, is it dismutates into hydrogen peroxide, which is very reactive, and hydrogen peroxide then forms the very reactive hydroxyl radical. A hydroxyl radical can form the peroxyl radical, Peroxyl radical being having oxygen's weak bond, they can initiate chain reaction with any of the macromolecules, cellular macromolecules. At the same time, so, uh, the, uh, the superoxide can combine with nitric oxide in the cell to form the uh, peroxynitride. Uh, so uh, this uh, is, if I can go into a little more detail to tell you that the ribosome has the reactive oxygen species, the lysosome has the enzymes to digest the macromolecules so it's a potent it's a very very potent bags in the in the cell that are actually can kill a pathogen but what happens sometimes we can't kill pathogens we do get sick and the pathogens take over so in, in there so there are various ways by which pathogens actually can um, uh, sort of strike against the defense of the host and so at the site of Killing. I'll just show you one picture that uh, referring to the reactive oxygen species. At the site of killing, we work with a pathogen which is called the Leishmania. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you about it. But this, uh, this pathogen, suppose, just assume that it's staying within a phagolysosome. What happens to that, uh, to that uh, parasite? So here it is attacking the macrophage. And what happens is that they try to, uh, they die die and these uh, yellow dots that you're seeing, seeing are actually the dots that are showing that their DNA has broken and they are dying. So the reactive oxygen species can make them dead. And then um, also that these are very old studies of ours, which we have shown that the phagolysosome actually generates the reactive oxygen species. The red is the lysosomal marker. Then green is the reactive oxygen species marker, and yellow is the overlap showing that wherever the pathogens are sitting, the Leishmania is sitting, they are generating reactive oxygen species. So we have worked quite a bit on that. I don't want to go into too much detail, but I think it's now clear that there are two compartments which are very important, one with the reactive oxygen species, one with the hydrolytic enzymes, and, uh, and that's how um, uh, pathogens are actually killed. But as I said, sometimes they are not killed and they thrive. How do they do? So the first step is the host cell fights back through reactive oxygen species or reactive nitrogen species. And they kill the pathogen when the whole cell is fine. Majority of the times probably happens, but when we do get sick. So what can happen is that the pathogen, when they uh, try to survive within the cell, and the host cell cannot remove them, the host cell chooses to die. So it dies by a process called cellular apoptosis. It can happen through pyroptosis as well. So the host cells, host cell would die, and the, the host cell will be engulfed by phagocytic cells, and it will be discarded, digested along with the pathogens. So that is one way of protection. The other way of protection for the parasite or pathogen is that they uh, dabble with the 
signaling cascade within the host cells and make their own niche and survive there. So that is a major subject of inquiry. And um, so they would support the host cellular machinery to survive themselves. So if you look at this uh, photograph, you see that when there is no oxidative stress, this rod, red dot are the pathogens surviving very happily. So if you have reactive oxygen species stress, they die by the cellular apoptosis. The green, green one is the marker. And there you see that the pathogens would die. So there are multiple aspects of those pathogen relationships, and it is very interesting to explore that. So when you remove a cell, say removing a cell, is the death of an infected cell, as I said, will induce death of the infecting agent as well. So phagocytes will engulf the apoptotic cell and efficiently dispose it off. So the pathogen is gone. The engulfment of phagocytes may lead to antigen presentation. As I alluded to that the activation of B cells and T cells are required. So antigen presentation may be there. Then phagocytosis of apoptotic bodies containing pathogens allows efficient fusion of phagosome and lysosome that the two I showed you in the uh, photograph over there and the cartoon that I showed you. Now, um, you know, there are many pathogens. So I just thought of giving some examples. The Lishmania parasite that we work on actually resides within the phagolysosome. And you realize how dangerous the phagolysosome is. Is it has the enzymes, it has the reactive oxygen species, it, it stays it stays very comfortably within the phagolysosome, so does another bacteria called Coxiella brevity and uh, and and the yeast cell, uh, the neoformans, they also stay in the phagolysosome. Now the mycobacterium tuberculosis actually stays within uh, phagosome. How they survive is they prevent the fusion of Phagosome, they actually prevent the fusion of phagosome and lysosome. And so, this prevention of this step is keep on surviving within the phagosome and not within the phagolysosome. So, there are other pathogens which also survive within the phagosome and some survive within the cytosome. So, there are many different kinds of uh, pathogens and there are many different kinds of, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, resistance that they give to the host. So um, there are many uh, steps by which a uh, uh, host can kill a microbe. So there are, uh, when there is a bite from, say, a vector and the pathogen gets in, there, there, are, there are a host of immune cells that uh, come and, and actually pick up these pathogens. Um, so antimicrobial peptides at the host mucosal surfaces are very important. Then pattern recognition research. So there are two major uh, pathways of cell death or apoptosis. One is the intrinsic pathway, another is the ex extrinsic pathway. So the intrinsic pathway is via the mitochondria. You all of you know what mitochondria is. And so the mitochondria releases cytochrome C, which were which are part of the respiratory chain cytochrome C is within the mitochondria. Once it gets out of the mitochondria, it dangerous. It's dangerous, it kills the cell. And so um, that's also you see how nature has evolved a function of a particular molecule. Then biocaspases, the apoptosis can occur. It can also occur through caspase independent processes. And the extrinsic pathway is through death receptors, death receptors on the surface of the cells. And it, it, it binds to the death, rece death receptor, then eventually activates the caspase and cellular apoptosis is there. Now, you see, there are, as I said, there are a variety of pathogens. Here, what you see is uh, that this uh, Yersinia also inactivates NF kappa B, and Salmonella also inactivates NF kappa B, which is a major signaling uh, transcription factor in the cell. So they, they, these are a variety of. I just, uh, you know, just figuring. Now they have, they have a digenetic life cycle, and from in the sand fly gut, they stay as uh, free swimming. Promastigos, and they are, they are when the sand fly bites the human, they get into the system. They become rounded emastigotes, which are immotile, and they, they cause the disease. And then they are again picked up by the sand fly, and the cycle goes on. And as I showed you, that it stays very com comfortably in the in, in the in the phagolysis of the host. Now, this uh, parasite actually, it, uh, how did this? As I said, why? How do the parasites survive? 
I mean, there are so many killing mechanisms we have. How do they survive? So during evolution, selection has worked on them, and they have also evolved some uh, important proteins. Here you see two proteins, which are called triperoxid peroxidase. The triperoxid peroxidase, there are um, uh, two. One is the mitochondrial triperoxid peroxidase. The name suggests it's located in the mitochondria, and the, cyto the cytosolic triperoxid peroxidase. It's, it lies in the cytosol. So these two enzymes are very important for the pathogen because it uses this to protect itself. How does it do? So it, 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 again, NADPH comes in and NADP, um, uh, it, it gives up an electron and it cycles through this enzyme cascade of tri uh, trigonothyme reductase, then a higher trigonothyme, uh, whereas they migrate to the mitochondria if you have the whole protein. So these are all overexpression experiments that we did uh, at one point of time. And we showed that uh, they they are, one is in the mitochondria, one is in the cytosol, and they have very, uh, they, they protect the cells against the peroxides produced. So uh, it's a very site-specific defense because the one uh, enzyme that is in the mitochondria, I'll show you here that in this Western blot, that when you give antimycin, antimycin is something that actually disturbs the mitochondria. So it's a mitochondrial stress inducing agent. So if you give that, the expression of mitochondrial triperoxin peroxide is increased. But when you give an exogenous stress like hydrogen peroxide, the cytosolic triperoxin peroxide is increased. So what it tells us, it tells us that the two enzymes at two different uh, places are uh, located at two different places so very distinct functions. And that's how the, uh, you know, uh, it has evolved. And so uh, eventually the, the, the uh, calcium comes in if they are, if the perox, they cannot eliminate peroxides, calcium comes in and there is DNA fragmentation, mitochondrial depolarization and other effects occur and the antiparasites uh, would die. So this is, uh, in a nutshell, about the enzymatic function of the triperoxin peroxide, which are actually eliminating peroxides that are formed due to reactive oxygen species acting on the cellular macromolecules. Okay. So now this uh, cytosolic peroxide, uh, cytosolic triperoxin peroxide, is what we found is that it uh, it is secreted out. So that we could locate in the spent media of the cultures and one it comes out through the flagellar pocket here and you can see in the spent media that there is some triperoxin peroxidase actually and uh, what we did was we took this infected cell cytosol we you know precipitated with uh, precipitated with anti-cytosolic triperoxin peroxide with antibody did a trips in digestion did lcms ms it blasted it and it reacted with one stretch of peptide which belonged to some protein called apoptosis inducing factor. So apoptosis inducing factor is localized inside the mitochondria and at the start of apoptosis it is released into the cytosol. If there is a apoptotic uh, stress it is released into the cytosol and it is able to trigger chromatin condensation and DNA fragmentation without going through the caspase route. So this is a caspase independent pathway and it is a death effector, direct death, death effector for that matter. And we, what we did was we confirmed it by immunoprecipitating with anti, um, with the anti apoptosis inducing factor and anti CTX and PX. And through immunoprecipitation studies, we confirmed that it is indeed apoptosis inducing factor that is binding to the cytosolic uh, triperoxin peroxidase. And when uh, you do uh, uh, in silico study, you do find binding uh, study, binding sites. But what we could not do or did not have the time to do is actually to do an in vitro binding study with the two, uh, two components. But then we ask the question what is the function? So what would be the function of this binding? So for that we, uh, uh, well, so, sorry, this is, uh, this is, I just wanted to show that apoptosis inducing factor, as I said, it migrates to the nucleus here in this one. We have used torosporin as a model to, uh, to, to uh, initiate a stress, 
And you can see here that this is where the, the, the proteins are in the cytosol. If you give storosporin, they migrate to the nucleus. In, 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 when you have overexpressed your uh, uh, CTX and PX, they don't go to the nucleus. So AIF sits in the cells. These are with mammalian experiments with mammalian cells. So AIF is very important. So now uh, we're doing a lot of experiments. What we found that if we infect by Leishmania, there is a release of AIF from the uh, mitochondria. And they, that brings about chromatin condensation and the area fragmentation. But if we uh, overexpress CTX and PX within the cell, we get that they bind, they bind to the AIF, and the AIF cannot migrate to the nucleus, and there is no DNA fragmentation. So the functionally, this protein not only is serving as an en enzyme clearing peroxidases, it also, when infecting the host, releases the uh, secretory CTX and PX within the host cell, and actually prevents the AIF from going to the uh, nucleus and binding and uh, killing the host cell. So this is a strategy of the parasite to how to stop the killing of the host cell. So this, this is what we showed. And you can imagine that there are some other pathogens which do similar things. But with AIF, there is only one other remote with listeria. But there are similar events that happen, which, it, which in, involves other proteins and not only the, the, the AIF. So um, the Leishmania is has a very um, uh, you know has a membrane which is very rich in LPG meaning lipophosphoglycans and it has ergosterol in it. it doesn't have cholesterol it has ergosterol in it. Now what we found was again through many experiments that this ergosterol is a very primitive protective protection system and if you if you downregulate the ergosterol by generating knockouts or with using steroid inhibitors. You, what you find is that the cell viability actually uh, reduces if you downregulate the steroids. It's a very, very primitive protection of the parasite when it goes into the host. The other one is that Ishmania parasites also protect itself against the attack of the host through undergoing autophagy. Autophagy is a process by which the cell eats, it eats itself, sort of. And it, it, it affords protection because after autophagy, the, the, there is a recycling of material for the cell to revitalize. So that is, uh, it, it actually pro protects against stress. So that is another uh, weapon in, with the parasite. Now, uh, it, it happens, you know, when heavy metals also induce pathogen apoptosis. And I just wanted to bring in this slide because I wanted to mention about Professor Ewan Brahmachari, who uh, invented this drug for uh, actually, uh, there were there were already uh, heavy metals and known to affect the pathogens. So he worked on this urea stibamine, which is uh, a drug for this uh, pathogen. It's antimony actually, and it's a trivalent antimony that is effective. This is urea stibamine, this pentavalent antimony. And uh, so, in sitting in this small room in Calcutta, he uh, actually made stocks and stocks and stocks of stibamine, and that saved thousands and thousands of people. He was uh, nominated for the Nobel Prize for three times, and he never received it, but his drug saved many people. We have worked on the heavy metals uh, like antimony and urea stibamine, and we, we have shown that the uh, parasite can actually um, uh, it, it can kill the parasite by generating reactive oxygen species within the phagolysis. So, uh, and that goes, is mediated through the mitochondria. So when we talk about the defense, we also talk about defense with some drugs. So the drugs here, you see that uh, drugs also act, but these drugs are very, very toxic. So, uh, but one has to, because Kalahaza kills, so these drugs had to be used. So now what I have shown you is that membrane component of uh, the parasite is uh, important as protection, like our posterior, I said. Triperoxidase peroxidase eliminate oxidative stress. Triperoxidase peroxidase derails the post-protective pathway and of, of its own apoptosis. 
and ADG8, which is a molecule involved with autophagy of cells, protects against stress, and mitochondria withstand stress to initiate the body. So these are the few things I summarized that I've shown so far. But interestingly, you know, there are other molecules, other um, molecules that either protect or bring about apoptosis. So there's a BCL2 family of proteins. Many of you may be familiar with it. So BCL2 either inhibits or induces the apoptotic process. They have several um, uh, members like the BAD, BAC, BIM, BOM, all of these are pro-apoptotic family uh, members. And then MCL1, BCL2 are anti-apoptotic members. So what happens is when BCL2, when BAC overpowers BCL2 in a sense, and it forms pores in the mitochondria, the cytochrome C comes out, and it forms the apoptosome, and uh, along with cytochrome C forms the, and then it uh, activates the caspases, and caspases bring out cell death. So uh, BCL2 in this way it protects the cells from death, but so BCL2 is a target for pathogens. So what it does here, what we found, that the uh, when the parasite when the parasite binds to the TLA2 receptors, it phosphorylates ARC and it phosphorylates DAC3, and that induces the synthesis of BCL2. So the level of BCL2 is upregulated. But what BCL2 does, it it does two things. One is that BCL2 prevents the nitric oxide. BCL2 uh, not nitric oxide directly, INOS. It prevents the INOS from actually forming the nitric oxide. And then BCL2 also prevents the BACs from forming the aggregates and making pores on the mitochondria. So that's how the cell cycle is affected. So the parasite actually can manipulate through the BCL2. So last I told you about apoptosis inducing factor, how the parasite was manipulating it. And this is where the host BCL2 uh, is actually manipulated by the parasite to initiate its own survival. And that is another uh, member of the BCL2 family who can also create pores on the mitochondria that is phosphorylated and inactivated through the TLR2 binding. So these are the, there are a lot of missing processes here that we don't know. But this is how the uh, uh, cell survival happens with the parasite. Now, production of nitric oxide is a key defense mechanism, as I showed that INOS is in, inhibited by BCL2. Now, BCL2 is a regulated pathogen, uh, common pathogen, that neutrophils, one of our avian cells, they pick up the uh, parasites or the pathogens. And the neutrophils, what they do, they, and it is not only with the Leishmania or uh, selective selected pathogens. Many pathogens increase the autophagic process within the cells. Okay, so they, they then the uh, neutrophil, which is very short lived, gives us the eat me signals on its surface. So what it is telling the macrophages is come and eat me. So when the macrophages actually engulf these cells, uh, the neutrophils laden with this parasite, what it actually does it, it releases the parasites within its uh, itself. And the parasite, as I told you, is very comfortable living within the phagolysis home of the macrophages. They start living there. So this is, in a way, the parasites are hiding behind and coming in. And then, with, along with the garb of the, uh, in the neutrophil covering them, then coming, the neutrophil disintegrates and is eaten up. They are released in the cytoplasm. Exactly how that process happens, we don't know. But then it thrives within the macrophages. So this is called a Trojan horse mechanism. If you know about the story of the Troy, when the uh, the the, uh, the uh, army came in in a, in, a, in a horse, these guys uh, they came in within the within the within a chamber which is formed in the horse and it was given as a gift uh, in Troy. So that is why it's called the Trojan horse mechanism. And if you see here, these are actual experimental pictures. You see that the um, the LC3 spots are there, which means there is increased autophagy. Then the it's higher than the basal autophagy, and starvation is the positive control, and uh, inhibitors of autophagy reduce the autophagy uh, in the in, in the cells. So then, um, then what happens is this: you see a macrophage is laden with this neutrophils, and they have within them the uh, the, the uh, neutrophils. 
uh, which, which contain the uh, parasite. And these are just markers, the LZ3 marker, which uh, if you prevent with 3MA, the markers are less, the starvation is high. So these are all controls and the experiments. But what, what the important thing is, what we saw, that if we prevent the autophagy from happening, if we prevent this autophagy from happening, the intake of neutrophils reduces. Which means that this process of autophagy is also triggering the possibility of the macrophages picking up the, picking up these disguised uh, pa pa uh, parasites within the neutrophils. So this is actually very interesting, and it happens uh, with, with with the Leishmania parasites. So this is and this is a very complex, uh, you know, uh, very complex uh, signaling process that takes takes place, which I will not detail. But uh, in summary, is that neutrophils actually hoodwink the macrophages to let the parasites live. So, um, so this is again another process by which the parasite gets advantage over the host. So, uh, what I'm showing here is this is a summary picture in which I'm showing that the apoptosis inducing factor is prevented from going to the nucleus by the cytosolic triperoxin peroxide. It is also at the same time uh, removing peroxides from the cell and preventing any chain reactions, uh, thus protecting the cell. The ATG8 increase also prevents the, the parasites from dying. Uh, and BCL2, which is upregulated in response to uh, the, the parasite entry, is preventing the nitric oxide. And so this in summary is what we showed uh, happens. I have selected some of these and you know, there are many, many experiments that has gone in which I cannot detail within this short time. Um, they're very interesting uh, experiments. But so, so based on this, what are the possible points of interference that we could think of as uh, Lishmania of uh, dest or destroying Lishmania? One is that BH3 mim mimetics. BH3 mimetics are the, the, the PCL2 mimetics, what it means. The, the domain, the BH3 domain, they may be. So that can, uh, because PCL2 was upregulated, we can prevent the increase in PCL2 and bring about uh, parasite death. We can use anti autophagic agents so that autophagy is increased, the parasites will die. We can use antioxidants like the triperidoxic peroxidase, which will save. Uh, the host cell, and of course, we can use in, in, in enzyme enzymatic activity. There are two distinct capabilities of the uh, triperoxid peroxidase. One is enzymatic activity. One is one is uh, the ability to bind to AIM. So the enzymatic activity can be inhibited by triperoxid peroxidase inhibitor. So this is uh, this is the way that one can imagine using these. Um, as as anti lishmanial agents. Now, I, in parasitic evasion of induction of cell death, I just want to mention a few that toxoplasma, trypanosoma, and tri they use inhibition of apoptosis as to survive. Trypanosoma brucei and lishmanial donovani induce apoptosis when required, uh, affecting the intrinsic pathway. That is how they survive. And it is not only parasitic uh, invasion, it is the bacterial evasion of apoptosis also occurs. And there are several bacteria you can see listed here who either induce or inhibit apoptosis as their way of surviving within the host cells. Viruses have an advantage because they can form mimics, like mimics of BCL2, uh, they will form, or the, they will also attach here in, in the receptor and so the, these are mentioned here uh, that the viruses can actually affect these uh, cell both cell death pathways like the mitochondrial pathway as well as the extrinsic pathway so uh, like this uh, there are there are many ways that can actually um, a pathogen can actually derail the host so we have to know the ways how to derail the pathogen itself so i just tried to give you a sketch of 
how we have worked on one such pathogen, but there are many pathogens that we could work on. And there, with the myriad of pathogens around, we really have to um, increase our research in these areas and try to figure out that what, what there is nothing common between the pathogens. They all had unique methods to survive. And the host also had unique methods to kill. So I hope you got an idea of this and just wanted to uh, acknowledge my students who have gone through my laboratory and the funding agencies. Thank you very much. I hope I'm on time or I just finished oh, them. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. And for this enlightening enlightening talk, uh, I mean, it is always fascinating to you know, know and learn about the immune system and this tussle between the host and pathogen, whoever smart the other. It's really indeed very nicely taught by ma'am. So I think uh, uh, the talk is now open for questions. If anybody has any questions, please uh, please ask. Yes. I can't you just wait for the microphone. I don't think it happens that downstream that they're actually evoking an immune response, the pathways themselves. Immune response is in, uh, evoked as soon as the pathogen uh, enters the host cell or touches the host cell to the, as, to the you know, pathogen production. So it is upstream. Of the immune system that they are able to recognize that 
that these are like out issues, you know, like self, non self, something like that that happens. And uh, I mean, we really don't know the answer of why these bacteria are not pathogenic, or sometimes they turn pathogenic, actually, they can turn pathogenic. And then you have this issues of then you have the problems. A kind of evolutionary question that we, we have so many genotic uh, systems from which we can get it. The question is that many of them, the animals don't suffer anything. No. I'm correct, but when it comes to humans, we suffer. Mm -hmm. Is it because of that domestication led to weakening of our immune response and therefore we begin suffering? Or uh, as people talk, that okay, the longer they live together, they will learn to live with each other. It's possible. It's possible because they are inherently, see, they have dead jump species, no? So inherently they have been staying with those, uh, like the bat harbors about 150 or 150 or that just for a couple of They came, they found many dead, dead rats, many dead rats, which meant that the bees have actually killed the rats. And because the rats were killed, they, they bit, they, the host, the lack of host made them bite the humans, and that's how the plague started. So it's possible that not all the time they get sick. Because normally rats are in there, they're in there, and they're, they're carrying the speech. So it's possible that what you're saying is a very interesting question to ask. Then, as I mentioned, that uh, these seem to have uh, protein family. It protects uh, parasite. Uh, uh, it protects the virus in the host cell. Is there any kind of uh, drug that we uh, use to downregulate this protein to give it this protection and clean or apple process? Um, you see, what happens is when a parasite or a virus or a bacteria which gets in and derails one of the host processes and makes itself survive. So there has to be very targeted, specific drugs for that particular pathway. So it's only in cancer cells that has been shown that targeted therapy works. But in case of infectious diseases, because you know the period of depends on the period of uh, illness or anything, so they have not been tried really. But in cancer cells, targeted therapy works. Um, I also have one question. So, ma'am, as you said that these uh, infections, pathogen infections, make some cells undead. So, do you think that they could be remotely connected in some cases with cancers as well? Because now, at least one thing is already covered that the cells are not dying, and maybe a few other things mutated, and then you have a cancer. Yes. A, I mean, any infection, any such kind of infection? Well, there, are, there are some infections. Just, uh, agents that cause cancer. So it is possible that they are preventing the cells to die. And, that's why and they are helping them. Yeah. Entirely possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, with that, I request. Uh -huh. Oh, ma'am, we still have more questions. Okay. I think there was no more questions. I think I was more questions. Just ask him. Ask him. Oh. transmitting the disease. So there is a switch and a vector can be switched from one mosquito to another. So over the germs, whether the germs decide or who decide, one doesn't know. That, uh, there are instances when they have shown that if during an epidemic, there is a, suppose you have an infection and the infection rate is very low. So 
those uh, those uh, mosquitoes are not biting humans enough so they can switch vectors and choose another mosquito which are more anthropic so these there are studies of these so there is a coevolution that is happening but at that time these kind of things keep happening So I request Anand Tripathi sir, please uh, honor our guest and present the memento. Um, I request Saurabh Sagar to please bring the memento. Removed. Uh, please bring the. I think we send to So I request you to please come uh, on the mic and uh, I'll give your perspective remarks. The distinguished speaker of the afternoon, Dr. Chandrika Shah, Mr. Rajiv Raman, Ms. Madhu Tapardia, Dr. Gaurav Pandey, Distinguished teachers, Professor Lakotia, Mrs. Lakotia, Professor Mercy Raman, other colleagues from the Department of Zoology, Biochemistry, Biotechnology, and other departments, and other students, as scholars of the Institute of Science. It's a day of Great satisfaction and pride for us that we had such a distinguished and dedicated, outstanding researcher amidst us. Thanks to Professor Espirai for the Memorial Foundation that we had this special occasion to hear her very, you know, insightful talk on the warfare which has gone on since eternity between the hosts and parasites. And as has been said that there has been co-evolution. Players, not only the pathogens, but within the pathogens, what are the players? How do they sense the hosts? And how do they respond? And not through one strategy, but through multiple strategies, they interact. And it's not only the pathogen, but also the host also adopts a variety of strategies to cope with this kind of invasion into its privacy. What was wonderful, most wonderful was that we have seen enormous amount of work done by her own group. Excellent piece of work addressing different aspects. And when she was talking, I was reminded of one Nobel laureate, Ada Yonath, from Israel. When she was working on ribosomes, at that time, I was hearing a talk in Baroda, the Nobel Prize lectures was there, she was talking. When she was working on ribosomes, 
she didn't know what would be the consequence, eventual consequence, and which will lead to the discovery of the antibiotics. Ribosome protein synthesis inhibiting antibiotics. And the point which I remembered was that deep rooted insightful science eventually helps us in finding newer strategies because as was shown that microbes are equally smarter or maybe smarter than us or the host and that's why the resistance to antimicrobials is coming up. Antimicrobial resistance is coming up in a very big way and we have to find targets and the methods of, to cope with these kind of aspects. So this understanding will, this kind of understanding, this is a kind of an example for all of us that we have to have a deeper understanding of the pathogens and the diverse ways it is able to invade in our system. And that will give us a handle on how to control these pathogens. So this was something very enriching and very you know, satisfying for us that we had a feat of this kind of lecture. It was not uh, based on the works of others, but entirely or largely based on the work which was done by her own group. Today, I would also like to acknowledge as I am a student of bacterial genetics, and, uh, this, and that gives me a reason to associate myself with the Espirai Chodhi Memorial Foundation, and I have been attending many of the lectures whenever they were organized and I had the opportunity to. And I think this was one of the very fascinating lectures today. And uh, the kind of work the Espira Chaudhary Memorial Foundation is doing, carrying forward the legacy of Professor Espira Chaudhary and trying to make all the endeavors to fulfill his dreams, starting from cytogenetics, to cell biology and then to molecular cell biology. This whole domain is expanding in the country and I'm sure that that must have been the part of the vision of Professor S. Pirachal. And many of the pillars of that cytogenetics group, they are sitting here and they are doing their best to take it forward. And I hope the younger generation of the faculty members and students, they will carry this pattern forward. And it was last year we had a nice lecture by Professor B.K. Thalma. Uh, I, I, I mean, I was not aware, that I had forgotten, but I had attended that lecture too. And, uh, but during COVID, this activity had gone down a bit, but I think uh, the foundation has picked it up once again. And I wish that this legacy continues and keeps expanding in the days and years to come. So I congratulate all the team members of the pillars of the Espirai Memorial Foundation for organizing such an important lecture. And as Professor Rajiv Raman showed, the kind of outreach activity which is being done that needs to be enlarged. I think the, as a uh, branch of the uh, cytogenetics group, the departments of molecular human genetics and the, the Center for Genetic Disorders, they are doing excellent work and that is in line with the vision of uh, so I was not fortunate to have met him, but uh, I see the reflection of his persona in the team, uh, the team which is steering for this Espirai Memorial Foundation. So with these words, I uh, thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. This is a very humbling experience to stand before you, and my best wishes to the foundation and congratulations once again for organizing this wonderful lecture. And I hope that in the years to come, We'll have these feeds more and more. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Uh, with that, I request Dr. Gaurav Pandey to please come and propose vote of thanks. Madam Professor Tendrima Saha of today's lecture, our Director Professor Anil Tripathi, Head of Departments, Senior Professors 
faculty members, guests, students, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we just witnessed a very nice, very wonderful lecture from uh, Professor uh, Saha, and uh, it was uh, already reflected in the number of questions we had, and I think we'll continue that. So on the behalf of uh, Espirit Chaudhary Foundation, I would like to thank ma'am for accepting our invitation and delivering uh, the lecture today. Uh, I would then uh, like to thank our director, sir, Professor Amit Tripathi, for uh, his uh, encouraging words and gracious presence. Uh, we would like to thank our uh, head of the department, Department of Zoology, Professor Arvind Acharya, for his support. Uh, we thank the head of the department of uh, chemistry, Professor Mayashankar Singh, sir, for providing the all facilities. Uh, there were many people involved in organizing this uh, lecture from faculty members to students and uh, non-teaching staff. So we would like to especially thank the students and non-teaching staff for uh, being involved in their work tirelessly for, I think, almost the whole week. And finally, I want to thank all the attendees, who, especially the students who came in great numbers. Um, thank you. So uh, with that, I thank you all uh, for, for coming and joining for this event.